we're back, Portland Sports Beat. It's been a while since I've seen you actually. It really has. Last yeah. time I had a big piece of cotton ball <laughs> hanging in my ear and I said, please, what you're going to do is right when the show starts, you're going to remind me to take it out. <laughs> and what did you not do? I actually pointed it out. Yeah, you pointed out once we were on camera, but you yeah. didn't say anything during the beginning of the show. You so You weren't specific. I wasn't specific no, enough. So. Okay. Well, either you got taller or somebody pumped up your chair a little bit. I don't know. Give or take. Yeah. I'll take no, the these chairs are pretty awesome, yeah. Ryan. These are great. A nice little addition. Yeah. So thank you. You're very welcome. You want to tell about the beautiful show we have today? Oh, How my gosh. We have so much going on today, actually. We have basketball coverage. We're going to cover some lacrosse. We're going to do some football. It's just all over the board today. So hopefully you guys can stick around for such an exciting show. I hope so. Yeah. So what's coming up first? Oh, we got boys basketball from Jefferson. We have the 5A state champs. We will have coach Pat Strickland, Kadeem Strickland, and Silas Melson, I hope I said that right. I'm you sure did. I did. Yes, I did. And um, I just want to mention that this is um, actually the 5A state champions with us today. So. The 5A state champions yes. with us here on yes. Portland Sports Beat. That's great. Yep. Hey, Portland Sports Beat, we've done a lot, haven't we, the last several weeks? We actually have. The and The first time we've been on set for a while, but we mm -hmm. were at the Rose Garden covering high school championship mm -hmm. basketball that was pretty great that was actually you? really fun yeah we interviewed a grape it's true and we also went to the memorial coliseum for the dance and drill competition yes. which was awesome That's to watch you missed out on that party i missed out on that but <laughs> you got to share those beautiful memories and i'm yes. sure you will enlighten all of us about that a little bit later so enlighten. we've done I a lot of great do. things from portland sports beat uh-huh you forgot to say your name what is it again Oh, my name is Michelle Cruz. Michelle Cruz, and I'm Brad Stein, and we're so <laughs> happy that you could be a part of this beautiful day because we have a great show coming up for you today. It's very invigorating. I'm going to cut you off right now and just pass it on to PJ. Okay. Do you know what I have <laughs> to pass it on, though? What we have <laughs> no. to do is I really have to pass it on. So here we go. Here we go, Michelle. You ready? Whew. <laughs> Brad, Michelle, thank you very much. With me today is the uh, 5A state champions, Jefferson High School, the boys team. Um, had a great year. Um, to my right is Coach Pat Strickland. Um, also with me is uh, Kaneem Strickland and also uh, Silas Melson. So um, why don't we start out, um, why don't we start out with, uh, with you, Kadeem. Um, explain a little bit uh, about yourself, um, like what position you play, what kind of style you have, and uh, what year you are. Um, I'm a point guard. Uh, I like to get into the offense and look for my man and play play good defense. And I'm a sophomore. You're a sophomore. Yeah. And uh, you are also the coach's son, is that correct? Yes. Yes. So what is it like being a coach's son and, and playing on a team that uh, of this caliber? Um, it's pretty much the same as playing any other, with any other coach. It's, but it's more like toward, it's, he t it's more me and him than with the whole team, but it's pretty fun. Yeah. Um, when I was younger, I also played with my dad as a coach, you know, kind of growing up. So there was also a lot of expectations on me from, from my dad. And it's not, it wasn't always a bad thing, but, um, you know, I played point guard and, and played quarterback in football. And um, he kind of expected me to know maybe a little bit more than he expected uh, the other players to know. Do you kind of get that with your dad? Does he kind of expect a little bit more from you just because of the position you play and the fact that you're around him so much? Yeah, he expects a lot more. He expects me to be ahead of everybody pretty much yeah does that does that help push you a little bit yeah it does all right <laughs> um silas why don't you go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself uh i'm a junior I'm a, uh, i play guard i can run uh, both the one and two and um i think my style of play is i'm really athletic I like to get up and down the court and i can score the ball pretty well um i think a little bit later we're going to see uh, we were out at a game that you guys played wilson and I think there's going to be a highlight reel on there where you had a, a pretty good putback dunk. So saying it, you're athletic is uh, is a pretty good uh, pretty good reasoning. Um, so you know you play a little bit of one, a little bit of two. Looking kind of towards the future, you know next year you have a sophomore here who also plays point guard. Um, do you see yourself maybe after high school playing the one, or do you see yourself maybe more as a two um, further on? Um, after high school, I'm probably going to play more of the point guard position because realistically. Uh, six three is a pretty good height to play point guard, mm -hmm. and um, I mean it depends on which school I go to though. 
because some schools like to use a uh, combo guard, two guard front. All right. Coach, um, tell us a little bit about how long you've been at Jefferson and um, kind, of, uh, kind of a little bit about yourself. Yes, I am Pat Strickland, coach Jefferson High School, uh, born and raised in Portland. I've been coaching at Jefferson since uh, 1999 uh, in an uh, assistant capacity. I've been a head coach for the past five years. Um, and uh, my day job, I work with the Department of Human Services Child Welfare, where I investigate child abuse and neglect. Wow, so that's, uh, you know, you're working with kids, but you're totally getting a different aspect of kind of the child welfare aspect there. Exactly. You know, I'm <clears throat> working with kids at all capacities. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I feel like, uh, well, I am a, uh, a counselor, a, a doctor, a therapist, <laughs> a little bit of everything. Uh, so I've been doing that for 19 years as well. So how did you get into, into that capacity? Well, you know, after I graduated from Oregon State in 1993, um, I kind of took a year off uh, just doing anything, just relaxing. And I had a, a friend of the family who was uh, on the management with DHS and kind of took me under his wing, taught me the ropes, and been doing it for 19 years. So how did you get from kind of doing that to into into basketball? Did you play here locally in the Portland area? Yes, I actually uh, I played at Wilson High School. I uh, graduated in 1989, I, and I played before that in uh, uh, Golden Ball AAU basketball just coming up. I've been playing basketball my whole life. Um, after I graduated from uh, college, uh, for the most part, uh, just kind of came home, uh, got into coaching young guys, uh, AAU basketball, and you know, it seems like it was yesterday, but it was 19 years ago, <laughs> and I'm still kicking. <laughs> yeah, so being here for 19 years, you know, there's definitely got to be a love for um, not only the kids, which, you know, you're working with kids all the time, but it definitely a love for basketball as well. No, totally. It's a, it's a big love for basketball. Like I said, I've been playing my whole life. Um, I have sons. Um, I've coached a lot of kids in the community. Um, so it is my life, even though I don't get paid a lot of money for it or barely any money for it. Uh, it's just a passion that I have, uh, just helping young men use basketball as a tool to uh, get their school paid for. Nice. Um, so Kadeem um, plays on the team now. You, have you had past um, kids that played on the team? <laughs> Uh, no. Well, I, I had a, I have an older son. You talking about a biological kid? Yeah. Or, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I have, I had, a, I have an older son who's 17. He played as a freshman, but uh, he doesn't play basketball any oh. longer, so he's no longer playing basketball. Um, but just, you know, kids that family members that I've coached, uh, just kids that that have grown up in the community that I've been known for a long time. Um, you know, I. Yeah, you know, I look very young, but it feels like I've been around forever. Yeah. When well, you say 19 years, I'm like, wow, he doesn't look like he's been coaching for 19 years. Well, congratulations on on that aspect. Um, t talk a little bit about um, what it's like to coach um, one of your one of your kids, and maybe the, the how you have to kind of temper the things that you think or say when it is your kid. Exactly. I mean, like anything in life, <clears throat> you know, you have your ups and downs. Uh, the coaching is no different, uh, even though Kadeem is my son. First off, it's a pleasure coaching him. Um, you know, we had our rough moments where, you know, I know he feels like I'm getting on him a little more than the other other guys, which, you know, somewhat I kind of am. Um, but like you alluded to earlier, I do or did expect him to, you know, kind of know, know a little bit more since uh, they always say the coach's son is uh, the extension of the coach on the floor. Um, no, but it, it's been great. Um, you know, I... I've been using a few different approaches as far as just coaching him, kind of just laying off of him a little bit and tearing in him a little bit. So I'm kind of torn between which one I'm gonna go for it with. But uh, you know, for the most part, it's been it's real. It's been a real good experience. I've I've coached not only Kadeem but Silas, uh, you know, growing up uh, in AAU basketball as well. So um, you know, I'm familiar with them. They're familiar with me. Uh, and you know, as a coach, you know, not not only because. Kadeem's my son or I have a relationship with other kids, you know, you want all the kids to be able to use uh, basketball and be successful in basketball. So, Coach talked a little bit about AAU. Um, Kadeem, why don't you talk a little bit about um, what AAU ball is for you um, and kind of like how it's maybe different than what you do in the, um, in the regular school ball. Um, for AAU, it's more up and down game, really. Just play against people all around the world and stuff and country. And pretty much high school basketball is just like run set plays, help defense, and all that kind of stuff. Which uh, which aspect do you like better? Do you like the the kind of school ball, or do you like the AAU? I like the AAU better. Which do you think will help you um, get to the next level a little bit better? Which one mimics what the college and the pro game is like? Um, well, AAU it helps you out with one on one game and stuff, but in college they run sets and stuff, so high school will help you with that too. 
Mm -hmm. Do you see like the pro game and how you know you guys you got like guys like LeBron and Kobe um, who do a lot more one on one? Do you kind of see that AAU game is kind of developing those skills? Yeah, I see that in AAU a lot. Yeah. Um, so uh, Silas, why don't you talk about um, the 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 aspect of with AAU? You know, it's free flowing a little bit more up and down. How do you prepare for an AAU game as opposed to uh, a high school um, game? Well, um, in high school games, you know, you go down to a locker room, you have game plans, you know, game plan against a certain player. AAU is just getting up and down, showing your skills, you know, just free flowing the game. So there's no set plays coming out? I mean, there are. I mean, there are, there are always uh, set plays, but, you know, AAU, you lean more so to, like, fast break side of basketball. Is that, you know, your athletic, high-flying kind of guys, do you like that AAU style a little bit better? Yeah, I like AAU much better. <laughs> so you get more dunks in the AAU game? Uh, well, actually, I mean, this year's first year I've ever, like, really started dunking in the game, so, you know, we'll find out this year. Yeah. Um, so you guys play on the same AAU team? Yeah. yeah which, ga which team is it? ICP. ICP. Um, how did you guys do last year? Uh, well, he's younger than me, so he played for a younger team. Oh, but, okay. um Last year, I mean, we played at the most competitive level of high school. So, I mean, I guess we did pretty good. I think we finished uh, 500. I think we were like 10 and 10 or something like that. Okay. Um, and the that um, AAU, is that something that you, like, continue to develop? And is that something that your skills are building during the summertime when you're not working on the high school ball? Does that really help develop those skills? Yeah, AAU. Yeah, I mean... You're playing basketball year-round with AAU, so you really can't, like, get rusty, lose a handle, lose your jump shot. Like, when you're playing AAU, you stay in your rhythm year-round. Okay, I think we're going to have a, a video coming up here pretty quickly from that uh, Wilson game. So uh, we're going to take some highlights, and we'll be able to see that dunk from you a little bit earlier. Um, just want to touch real quick, since you coached both AAU and the, um, the school ball, what is the difference coming from it as a coaching aspect? Well, uh, the difference, a big difference is uh, AAU basketball. A lot of times it's um, towards the end of the spring and the summer and the kids are not in school. Um, and the other difference, like the, like the boys said, um, AAU, you do run sets and you run plays and things like that, but it's more geared towards letting the boys get up and down. Um, you know, some programs are a little different. You know, some are structured to where they run in all sets and some are structured to where they just roll the ball out and let you play. And in high school ball, you you know, you're a little more into it because it's guys from the neighborhood, it's guys living in the same um, vicinity of each other, um, it's more like a close-knit family. And, um, you know, you get more time with the kids. You get to practice more. You get to, you know, like Silas said, you get your pregame, your, your halftime, your, your postgame. So AAU is more fast-paced where, you know, you got two minutes to warm up. You know, you got one minute of halftime break. Uh, so. And, and that's a big difference. Uh, and then plus, on the AAU scene, you're playing against the best guys across the country. Now, in high school ball, you know, if you're not a traveling high school team, you're generally playing against other high school that's in your area. All right. Sounds pretty good. Um, let's go ahead and take a look at the uh, video highlight from earlier. It's uh, Jefferson versus Wilson earlier in the year. To the basket, Hayden Hall with two points. Off the mark. Melson brings it down, quick three. Off the front of the rim, rebound back out to Jefferson. Hall underneath with the foul. What a dunk by Melson. My, my, my. That's a highlight reel right there. Working with Sanders. Sanders with the steal. Down court quick to Melson. Melson tries to dunk it again. Can't get it to fall. Rebounds it twice and drops it. Looking. 
what a nice drive by Sanders for the alley oop there to Melson. Just couldn't get it to fall. Quick down the court, though. Wilson takes no time. Looking for the lob underneath as well. He can't connect onto it. That was Ruben. Coming from Lynch. There's Paul down court all the way again. And one for the big man Lynch. He went coast to coast on that uh, fast break. And it's amazing to see a guy of his size and length to be able to hand the ball all the way up the court and lead the fast break and actually finish. And the three, he got the shot. Could get the drop. Rebound by Sanders. Sanders drives the length of the court, and they're going to count it. Lynch gets the pressure from Melson, bringing it up court. Finds his man at the three point line, takes the shot, and it's good. That's Ruben with the three pointer. Got Hayden Hall back in the game, controlling it. Brings it over to Hall. Jr. Nice pass by Hayden Hall. Keep his eyes open. Got Pashal handling the ball here on the key. Switching sides, back to Pashal at the top, into the lane. Finds Hayden Hall for the three, and it drops. Hayden Hall with the big three-pointer. Yep. Pashal over to Strickland. Baseline, can't find the shot. Pichal ends up with it. Over to Hayden Hall for another three. In the same spot, he hits it. Two big threes by Hayden Hall. Back to back. Sportsbeat.com. You can also check us out on Twitter, at PDX Sportsbeat. With me, Jefferson High School, the boys' 5A uh, championship team. Um, Coach Pat Strickland, Kadeem Strickland, his son, and uh, Silas Milson. Um that was a great game. We watched the uh, the highlights from the Wilson Jefferson game. You guys uh, kind of trounced them. Your alma mater, right? <laughs> exactly. Was there was there a little extra in there on that one? Yeah, no, it wasn't a little extra. I knew that Wilson was having a down year, so um, you know the boys just went out and played, but yeah. looking for it to blow them out or anything like that. But it did happen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was a great game. So I want to get uh, to the five um, A tournament. You guys were down in state, down at uh, Matthew Knight Arena. Um, you guys uh, started out with Willamette. You guys beat them 85-62. Expectations for this year, you guys came out, you guys, um, Coach, I think we want to talk about this a little bit. The, you had eight players transfer um, yes. from this team. So kind of go over a little bit of what your expectations were coming into this year after something like that happens. Uh, yeah, well, despite eight guys transferring out of Jefferson for various reasons, um, you know, the ex expectations were that uh, we had enough. I knew that we had enough in the covers from the young guys and the guys coming back that we could make a strong push at state. Um, and you know, the boys came together at the right time and started playing, you know, team ball and, and playing together. And I preached to them all year long that if you do those things, um, you know, at the end of the year, then confetti will fall on you. So when you get, when you have players that um, are, you know above you maybe and you know playing time is kind of kind of there is that something that you guys were like hey those guys left that means a bigger opportunity for me is that how you guys felt when when those players transferred Kadeem uh no not really because I was pretty much getting the same amount of playing time but it just gave more opportunity for for to have less guys on the floor and yeah, yeah, just play what about you um I mean, the same as Kadeem, I had a big role on last year's team, too, but I think that uh, all those players transferring that, um, actually gave us all a bigger role, like our core rotation. I think that we all had to step up and play more. Nice. Um, so let's talk about the uh, 5A uh, tournament. You guys started out with Willamette. You guys, I said a little bit earlier, <laughs> once at 85-62. Um, what was it like when you were going into the, the state tournament, Silas? Um that first game, we really wanted to set the tone for the playoffs. So we just went out there and played hard and uh, wanted to go to Eugene with momentum. Um, so you guys then went on to uh, West Albany. Um, that was a close one. You guys won 55-52. Um, walk us through the, the West Albany game and kind of how, how that one played out. Um, it was pretty tough. They played a tight zone the whole game. so And we weren't even knocking down outside jumpers, so we had to penetrate more. Yeah. At the end, it just worked out for us. So, as a point guard, and you get into a game like that where they're they're playing, you know, they're packing it in. 
um, do you find your lanes harder to find and the passing lanes a little bit tighter or is that something that you are you more comfortable shooting from the outside um, I'm I'm comfortable shooting from the outside, but I like to get in the gap sometimes too, and look for open man. So, what kind of uh, adjustments did you did you make in that game to kind of deal with that zone? Uh, I tried to uh, search the gaps and just attack the gaps. Nice. Um, so the next uh, Silverton, um, you guys, which was one of the teams, I think they were ranked number two or three in the state. They were three. Three, yeah. Yes. So. Um, that was a great, a great game. Um, one of the better teams in the state. Um, Silas, why don't you walk us through um, the Silverton game? Um, Silverton, they had the uh, five A player of the year, born in Portland State next year. And um, really, our goal in that game was to uh, shut him down. But I think in the first half, when we were up by a lot, I think we did a pretty good job of that. But some players got in foul trouble. We had to make a few moves, and um, he kind of got loose. But you know, we just stuck it out and held it to the end. Coach, so when you have a player of that caliber, um, wh how do you change your plans defensively to kind of deal with someone like that? Well, you know, you don't necessarily change a lot. You just tweak a few things. And the things that we uh, tweaked was, um, you know, just kind of, you know, more so than other guys, make, make it tough for him to shoot the jump shot. So corral him and make sure other guys are in position to help out. Um, you know, Zach's a, 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 gr a great high school player. Um, you know, like Silas said, um, Silverton caught us on our best first, our best half of the season, that first half. Uh, we were in control. We controlled Zach. Um, second half, uh, the great player he is, he, he kind of got loose and uh, kind of propelled his team on a, on a, on a comeback. Um, and we were just happy that there was no more time on the clock. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, and then we go to the championship game, Churchill. Um, you guys beat Silverton 67-58, uh, so you guys, you guys handled them pretty well. Um, they had, like you said, a pretty good second half. But um, going to the championship game against Churchill, you guys, it's been two years since you guys have won a state championship. So um, neither of you were on the championship team from the last one, correct? Not, right. even, no. not even in high school. Yeah. So, so what is the pressure that, that you feel, or is, was there pressure did you feel going into a championship game? Um, I don't think there was any pressure, really, because we weren't really the favorites to win it, but our community was counting on us and everybody in Portland was counting on us, so we just had to do it. Silas? Yeah, as he said, I don't think there was uh, much pressure. I mean, there were some nerves in there. I was a little nervous at the beginning of the game, but I mean, first few minutes, you get all the nerves out, you all good for the rest of the game. So, you know, you guys come from Jefferson. Um, you guys, a pretty good program, known, especially in, the, in this Portland community, um, known as one of the top basketball um, programs in the area. And Real quick, just talk what it means to play for a program like that. Um, <laughs> to play for Jeff, uh, I came here to play basketball mainly because I knew it was a championship school. So, I mean, he's really lucky to play for a Jefferson basketball team, knowing the expectations that you have. You got a Jordan contract, got good history about winning championships. And you really, you know, you don't want to let the history down. You want to uh, keep that culture going and win. How about you, Kadeem? Uh, I really I came to win championships. I know I would get at least one. I'm looking to get two more. Nice. All right. So championship game. Um, you guys are playing um, Churchill. You guys end up winning the game. Um, walk us through. Um, walk us through that game and kind of how it unfolded, Silas. Um. Well, I mean, the game we fought a lot of adversity in that game. Uh, I got in foul trouble. I think one more player got in foul trouble. And then Churchill, they couldn't miss a shot in the beginning of the game. They was making all types of threes. But really, I think that we uh, fought back pretty good, played good defense down the stretch. I think that's really propelled us to uh, win the game. So, Coach, um, team being down, um, how do you fight through? How do you get these players to fight through something like that? Well, first, I feel as a coach, you have to stay cool and calm, um, and you have to give your guys that energy and that, that positive vibe. Um, and also, um, you know, just from day one of our basketball season, just preaching the things that we preached as far as, you know, playing hard, never giving up. Um, it's going to be a lot of adversity, um, and we just have to fight through the adversity. Um, and my guys did it, and that's why um, we got fitted for our rings the other day. Did you get them rings? Well, they, we're getting rings. We got fitted the other day. Nice. Um, but, uh, you know, as far as coaching, I, I say that, um, you know, whenever you have um, a group of good soldiers, you know, it's going to be that much easier to win the battle. 
All right. Well, I just want to say thank you guys for coming on. This is Jefferson High School, the boys, 5A state champions, bringing the championship back to Jefferson High School. Congratulations, guys. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Welcome back. I'm Brad, and that's Michelle, and this is Portland Sports Beat. You can find out more information, you can listen, and you can watch on portlandsportsbeat.com. Do you know how you have a host and you have a co-host, and you wonder what we do when the camera's not on us? Well, I'm going to share you a little moment. I'm going to take you back to exactly what happened. We're off camera, and I get these little notes from my co-host, Michelle, and it says... Do you like the color of my nails? <laughs> I am off camera, I so I do. simple, you know. I just. I reply, <laughs> yes, I do like them. <laughs> I do. So that gives you a little insight exactly what happens. It's a question, actually. So. Yeah, I, I guess you can say that is. Um, <laughs> well, thank you to the Jefferson Democrats <laughs> for coming and giving us a great interview. We definitely look forward to the tournament coming up. Yeah, that was um, a great interview. Yeah, that resume that Coach Pat Strickland had was impressive, to say the least. It really was? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. What can you tell me about Central Catholic Girls? Is that a pop quiz? Maybe. Am I supposed to know this? Possibly. Okay. So, um, well, Centric, Central Catholic Girls 6A girls basketball team mm -hmm. um, will be actually here, um, what is it, two weeks from now? So yeah. April 10th. April 10th. And... The Valley Catholic girls who won the 3A championship and my Portland Community College Panthers, led by head coach Tony Broadus and a couple players, will be joining. So that is three. That's going to be a big show. That is April 10th here at the studio. You can watch on <laughs> PortlandSportsBeat.com. You don't want to miss that. I had the pleasure to be the public address announcer for Portland Community College basketball, and head coach Tony Broadus did a fantastic job. Didn't win, but they won enough games. So it, it's, he's going to be great. He's going to bring a couple players. Hopefully the assistant coach, Aaron Bell, will also be there. So that is a can't-miss show. Are Michelle. you going to be here? I will be here. I will be hosting that. I would not miss it. Are you going to be here? <laughs> That's possible. It's I don't know. Possible. It depends. I mean, you kind of offended me about my nail color. No, I, I liked your nail color. I was, <laughs> it was great. It was just a little off. That's what happens <laughs> off camera. It's just a little humor. It's all good stuff. All right, Tom. Go ahead, roll the little football clip. We have a football clip for you from the Portland Bolts. Yes, yes. Oh, break, good. The pads are popping for the first time this preseason as the Bolts ready for their first game in three weeks. This is P.J. Miller with your March 23rd Portland Bolts update. The Bolts were running at about 75% as they got used to the pads today, but they got a lot done and worked a ton on their no-huddle offense. It's easy to spot the players who have played under Fentress in the past. They've got the formations and the routes down. Others are learning under fire.
never easy telling grown men what to do, but Coach Ventress has been doing this for a while. He has to deal with everything from equipment issues, discipline, roster decisions, and installing his no-huddle offense. Just wanted to give you a little taste of Coach, so we mic'd him up. That's awful. Hey guys, sell a goal move too. Don't just run straight, you gotta sell a goal move. I, I didn't even think you're going deep. You just ran straight. You're not going anywhere. You gotta give a nod like you're going deep. The DB must think you're going deep. Otherwise, it doesn't work. You can't just run straight. Sell, sell, ah, stop. Boom. And, and, you, and your arm, listen, when you guys stop, you can't stop like this. You're telling the entire world you're coming back. Kyle, your arms flew up like a bird. Dude, your arms flew up like a, I don't want to hear excuses. Your arms flew up like a bird to say, yes, coach. Seriously, thank you. That's all you need to say. No freaking excuses. I don't care. If I give you a coaching point, say yes, coach, and do it right. Nice elbow pad, Kalani. <laughs> it's just one, too. <laughs> Dude, we, you know, underneath our gear, we look good, but the jerseys, we look ridiculous. <laughs> yes, do not put this on the website. <laughs> oh, DJ! Hey, was that blue 71? Yeah. Or you need to be wider? Yeah, you should be out there. That draws the corner to you and then opens up the corner route, and it's, it's, it's easier throw for the quarterback. Yep. We're down there. Hey, we're going to be going at a tempo. Oh, let's go. 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 Hey, okay. <laughs> hey, okay. We're, this is not live. Do not crack. Do not crack my receivers, Pablano. Pablano. Hey, man, piece of shit, crap. Stand up, and one guy just knocked down four guys and one of your own. Then everyone's like, "What's going on?" Get there and just, you know. I just keep getting my, my feet great, 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 great. I'm getting beat, and I don't like. I keep getting messed up trying to go for that ball, and then it gets. So I just try to be in the place. No, no, you're, just bouncing. you're making good football plays. <laughs> We're All back. Right. Are we? I don't know. Okay. Are we? Yeah. Yes, your nails look very, very nice. <laughs> okay. So does your hair. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so what did you think about the Portland Bolts video there? I thought the pads were popping, as PJ would say. <laughs> pads were popping. I'm sure Aaron Fentress would love that. 
the Portland Bullets, if you can't get enough of them, their preseason starts April 13th, if I'm not mistaken. And then their actual yes. season starts so, May 11th, it looks 2013. like. 2013. So. Yes. That's right. You be, you're going to be there? Hillsborough Maybe. Stadium? Maybe. That's right. The PDFL, the Professional Developmental Football League. Can't wait. Should be exciting. That's awesome. And Sportsbeat will be covering some games. Yeah, lots yeah. of them, actually. So what do you know about lacrosse? I actually don't know all that much about lacrosse, but You I want me to fill to. you in on would, something? Yeah. It's played with a ball. Uh-huh kind of looks like this yeah this is a lacrosse oh, really ball. that's oh, okay. right this is a lacrosse ball I'm going to demonstrate and I'm going to throw it to the coach who we have on here from Glencoe his name is Nick pronounce it right yes Nick what's the last Deneff. name Deneff okay this is the ball now it's caught <laughs> by the head Whoa. coach from Glencoe <laughs> thank you there Brad <laughs> got out of the Glenco head coach with us tonight is Nick Deneff. He's here to uh, move us into a new sports beat program that we're going to do about lacrosse over here. We're actually going to get into that game coming up later this week. But before we get into the games of lacrosse, we're going to learn about this sport. And Nick, you've been in it for quite some time, haven't you? I have. So how long have you been the coach at Glenco now? You've this is my uh, fifth year as the head coach at Glenco. Okay, and you've had a lot of success up there. So you said you've been a two-time head coach of the year now for the uh, division, Pacific Division, and last year you were the 2012 coach of the year for him, so. I was, yeah, it was, uh, you know, I think a, a good coach has good kids, so the honor's not all mine. It's about the kids beneath you that exactly. you've been able to teach, so. Exactly. But you've learned a lot about the game and obviously been in it for a while. Did you play in your younger days? I did, so uh, I actually started playing at Lincoln High School, uh -huh. uh, right across the river from us, and uh, continued playing in college for a little bit and, and kind of came back and continued playing and coaching. So you've kind of been through the years that we've seen lately of the cross just kind of boom coming as you would say. I mean it's really just getting bigger out here in the Midwest, the West all in general, pretty much the whole you know North America right now. It's <laughs> yeah uh, it's uh, the fastest growing team sport in the United States uh, and it's been that way for the last few years so in terms of uh, kids playing it's it's great to see that kind of growth nationwide. I heard it also is the uh, fastest high school growing sport in Oregon right now. It is. If I believe that's the correct. Yeah, so um, you're, you're right in the middle of it where you see new kids, new teams, and kind of the adventure starting up of it and everything. Exactly. So I think when I started playing uh, back in the late 90s, there was 15, maybe 20 teams. Uh, and this year, they're up to 52 teams. And in the state. In the state of Oregon. Uh, and I th and looking to expand into the 70s here in the next four to five years. Oh wow! So you're just planning on more and more growth as you go along. Absolutely. And Absolutely. I, I say we were talking about a little bit that you all really branch out to seven different states in the West right now. That Oregon kind of yeah, teams so go and play and exactly. So in terms of uh, teams getting out of state to play, you just have more exposure to increased competition. And so uh, there's been a number of teams that have gone this season to play games uh, against teams from Idaho, Utah, Colorado, Arizona, essentially the entire West Coast. So, so your kids get to travel a lot more than if you were to play one of those uh, more, shall we say, you know, formidable sports of football where people kind of more into it and everything that this American sport as people are looking at it. You know, it's exactly. you're giving the kids more of an adventure out there right now. Exactly. I think, you know, the way sports have gone, it's this is kind of the new trajectory in terms of traveling and doing those things, I think, has been spawned by a lot of the, you know, AAU and basketball or a lot of these club organizations that kind of operate during the summer. Um, so this is kind of now taking the traditional high school experience and, and uh, kind of incorporating some of the off-season stuff and, and teams are traveling a lot more now. And so, what, so what do you, the growth of the sport, what do you attribute that to? I think it's just one of the best games. Um, it, it combines so many different elements of every other sport that I think it really kind of feeds uh, into a lot of kids' Uh, excitement and enjoyment and, and what they like out of certain sports they can take bits and pieces as they come into lacrosse so when you talk about like the the different pieces of sports maybe give a little example of of what you mean by that exactly so you know just the simple mechanics if you don't mind holding yeah. that for me the simple mechanics of just throwing and catching essentially you know if i'm throwing over to you i'm not going to square up and face you i actually want to turn my shoulder and the motion's going to be identical to throwing a football 
or throwing a baseball where you'll actually extend your hand, you'll come through with the hips and, and roll over with your forearm as you, as you release the ball. With the cross, it's the exact same motion. I'll stand with my shoulder pointed to you, I'll come through with my hips, snap through as, as the stick releases the ball towards you. And it's that same kind of snapping motion with your forearm that you're creating. So uh, combining a lot of simple elements of that, um, you know, really kind of, I think kids who have athletic backgrounds can really take to the sport. So when you, when you look at a sport like football, it's, you know, it's a very physical um, contact. Does lacrosse have kind of that physical aspect like football does as well? Absolutely. So contact with the stick is essentially part of the game. And um, there's two different kinds of sticks. There's a shorter stick, which is this one, which is used by uh, offensive players. Um, and then there's a longer one that's six feet long that's used by defensive players. And the stick isn't necessarily used to sit there and whack on the person, uh, even though it kind of is. But essentially, you're able to use that stick to try and dictate where that offensive player goes uh, and to try to create disruption to what they're trying to do. So, yeah, I think it is fun for kids to kind of get out here and, and whack people, but they also <laughs> learn you throw that big check, it's not going to lose the ball uh, or dislodge the ball, and the guy can run through it. So, um, Well, it's kind of like hockey in that sort of fashion mm -hmm. where if you check them in a wrong fashion, you get a penalty, they put you in that penalty box. Exactly. So, or if you miss them, you're, they're scoring a goal a lot quicker than you uh, thought they could. They're a lot quicker down the field. Exactly, exactly. So the makeup of kind of uh, how it works, um, why don't we go into a little bit, um, maybe we, we have a, a whiteboard here. Um, maybe draw up kind of the, uh, the, the way the teams are set up, um, how many players are on each team, and kind of the positions. Of course. So lacrosse is, is like football in the sense that you have different – players doing different positions requiring different skill sets. And how that actually works onto the field is that you'll, on any given side, this midfield line right here is essentially kind of the dividing line. At all times, it's going to be 6v6 on one side or the other side of the field, whoever has offensive possession. So in this situation, if we just have our six offensive players, we would also have six defensive players playing against them. And these D players would be set up over here. If the ball was transitioned onto the other side of the field, there would always have to be four players on the defensive side of the field. So essentially, only three offensive players, who are called middies, who play offense and defense, go over the midfield line and their three defensive middies will go with them and actually transition from a defensive player into an offensive player. So at this point right here, you'll literally have three, as we call attackmen, because they're constantly playing attack or trying to attack the cage, standing at the midfield line, watching play continue on that side of the field until it transitions down to their side of the field. And then there would be a goalie for each team as well? And there's a goalie for each team. And the goalie wears very minimal padding. He stands in a 36 square foot uh, framed goal. It's obviously in the middle of the field, which is a unique characteristic uh, because you're able to attack uh, from the backside. Okay, so uh, when we're looking um, at this, um, when we're moving around and stuff like that, how do these how do these players react when the when the ball comes over here as compared to over here? What's kind of the the flow of the game as it goes? Absolutely. The flow of the game is very similar to basketball in a lot of respects. And, and in fact, I find that kids who have strong basketball backgrounds come in and really adapt to the sport of lacrosse. Very similar defensive movements, staying balanced, staying low, hands out in front, constantly moving to see where the ball is and where your man is. Um, and then offensively, what you're really trying to do is dodge, penetrate, move the ball and find the open man. So uh, uh, just a quick offensive play that we'll typically run is you want to create space for your offensive player. We'll go through on a quick dodge here. We'll force what you, what you would probably call as a rotation or a slide in um, basketball. And then you quickly want to move the ball to the opposite side of the field to find the person who's, been, who's open because of that uh, movement, movement. So 
so offensively, it is a lot about like movement and spacing, like it is with with basketball or football or any of those other. When well, you kind of have the same pick and roll style that you use in basketball, don't Absolutely. you? Sort of where you're playing players off of each other to kind of get them a free man and open, and you know, swinging around the backside of the goal, sort of thing. It's that kind of whole play set up where you have a pick and roll and a roll off a guy. Exactly. Actually, when Naismith was uh, developing uh, basketball. He was already exposed to lacrosse, and lacrosse was one, was actually the predecessor to the pick and roll. It was originally a lacrosse play that Naismith adapted as he started trying to come up with the game uh, indoors. Um, and so, a pick and roll is, is something that's been in lacrosse for 125, 150 years, and, and you still see it in the game today. So, lacrosse, you said 125, 150 years. Talk about the history of lacrosse. Um, it's it's a very long tradition here in the states. Absolutely. Well, the history of lacrosse actually goes back to the Native American cultures up in um, kind of the Ontario, northern um, New York area, uh, eastern Cherokee, Ojibwe, uh, Onondaga. Uh, there's uh, all, all these tribes had uh, started to use this sport, where it infuses a lot of cultural and spiritual elements and instead of kind of going to war they would use lacrosse almost as uh, a way to settle disputes uh, to kind of lay claims to rights to to kind of settle differences essentially and, and it became a way for warriors to actually stay trained to stay in shape um, and, and to kind of maintain their uh, you know kind of mean streak or competitive <laughs> nature about them so um, the, the sport goes back into the 15th, 16th century with Native Americans uh, when the French came over and started kind of colonizing uh, that part of the country uh, they saw the stick and called it lacrosse because it looked like a cross to them uh, and hence kind of the name started from there um, ever since then uh, there's been clubs that have been formed uh, kind of on the uh, white or, or um, uh, European side um, of things where they have uh, had clubs since 1870s, 1860s because of the Europeans' kind of fascination and enjoyment with the Native American game. Well, I was going to say it's one of those sports that really worldwide it's still just growing as much as it is here in the States right now. I mean, it's kind of like I was looking at the championships and the world mm -hmm. championships. It's kind of really been dominated by five or six main teams. Absolutely. And there hasn't been that competition level that, you would look for if you had that world competition of soccer or baseball that we just saw finish up and that sort of thing. It's, lacrosse is still very much finding those underdogs that can make the game happen. Absolutely. I think, you know, there's a real foothold just because of the history and, and uh, the epicenter uh, territorially being kind of right in North America and especially up in the northeast part of the U.S. Uh, but, you know, you're looking at some of the, the best countries in terms of lacrosse. England always has a very strong national team. Australia has a very strong national team. Um, countries like Germany and the Czech Republic are getting it. And one of the unique things about the cross is at the national level, uh, there's actually the Iroquois nation. Um, and so anyone who has uh, Native American birthrights in the Confederated Tribes for the Iroquois, they actually form their own national lacrosse team where they go out and compete against the Canadians oh, and the U.S. Wow. and all of those. So That's awesome. It, it's a really neat component about the sport. What's so, that? so um, you talked a little bit about um, kind of the, the the state of Oregon and kind of how clubs um, right now. This is not an OSAA sanctioned sport. Is that correct? With the exception of a few school districts who picked it up, yes. Yes. So why don't you explain kind of um, how lacrosse works here in Oregon? So currently, uh, it is administered at the club level, um, and that means that we do not receive some of the preferential treatment that the traditional sports receive and mostly that's going to center around funding and uh, field allocation um, and I think there's some positives and negatives to that but with the way the sport is is governed it's governed by the Oregon High School Lacrosse Association uh, it's a volunteer board um, and they essentially help govern keeping standard operating procedures, assigning referees, uh, keeping everything consistent in terms of playoff structure um, and uh, rules and officiating and all those things. And so um, here in Portland, you know, we have some, some pretty good teams. Lincoln um, has been very, done very well for the last couple of years. Lake Ridge, Lake Oswego is doing pretty well. Westland, 
Um, we've kind of looked at some of these some of these schools and all Americans. Oregon seems to have a pretty strong uh, foothold in in lacrosse. Absolutely, it's it's wonderful to see it too. Um, Peter Baum, who came from Lincoln High School, just won the Tuaraton. Uh, Tuaraton, I think, is the old uh, Ojibwe word for um, lacrosse, but I could be mistaken on the tribe. But he just won the Tuaraton Trophy, which is essentially the Heisman Trophy of lacrosse, the best player in the nation at lacrosse uh, for Colgate, uh, and he's playing at Colgate University, and it's I think it really uh, sheds a light on kind of how fast the sport is growing nationwide. So we're going to have, we actually have a video from um, him, but I wanted to talk real quick also about um, uh, Major League Lacrosse. He was actually the number one pick in this year's uh, draft, is that correct? Absolutely. Uh, with another kid from Lincoln High School uh, who goes to, to Drexel University, um, it, it's, it's really neat to see. Uh, they're now the second and third draft picks for uh, local grown talent. Um, and that's just, you're talking about in the last 10, 15 years of the sport being in the state. All right, so let's go ahead and take a look at that video of uh, Bomb. There we go, and we're back. All right, we're back. Um, that was Baum, who was the number one pick in the um, Major League Lacrosse draft, and he was also the winner of the equivalent. What's the name of the award again? Tuaraton. Tuaraton, which is the equivalent to the Heisman for uh, college um, lacrosse. So real quick, we wanted to get a quick demonstration of kind of how lacrosse, the, the mechanics of, I know I always see those guys picking up the ball, spinning, their, spinning the stick, and kind of uh, what you do with those and, and why you're doing it. Exactly. So, um, it, you know, it wouldn't make a lot of sense to just be running down the field holding your stick like this with a ball in it. So essentially what you do is use centrifugal motion to keep the ball in the stick. And the, the motion is called cradling and is essentially kind of the use of your shoulder, as I always like to teach it, and your fingers. And you want your stick always in your fingers and all it is is running, being able to move the stick uh, and also it also helps with any contact to the stick. You can typically use that centrifugal motion to fight off any contact. Um, in terms of the throwing mechanics and shooting mechanics, everything you want, elbows always away, always uh, protecting the stick with your body where it's very similar to basketball in that respect, where you're typically turning sideways, you're always trying to keep the ball to the outside. It's the very same uh, concepts with the, the lacrosse stick. Um, and since it is a very contact-oriented sport, you your body is essentially your shield to be able to uh, effectively run an offensive <laughs> set. So uh, there's a lot of bruises uh, and there's a, there's a lot of contact that comes with it, but it's, it's surprisingly something that you just get used to after a little bit of playing. Um, in, in terms of picking up a ground ball, if there's a ball on the ground, it's very similar concepts. It's getting low, it's wanting, always wanting to scoop through it, two hands, bringing it right back up to your ear for protection because you'll typically be having people uh, hitting you with the stick um, on your hips or your hands as you're going for it um, and and moving the ball quickly through passing and catching. Um, other than that, I'd probably need some more space to get through some of the other things. Well, what else would you like to know? I'll tell you, you really helped me understand. I found a quote earlier online about lacrosse, and it says, lacrosse combines the individual skills of baseball, physical demand of football, team strategies of basketball, and the conditioning required for soccer. And you've kind of really explained that 
all of those sports come together, and if you can play one of those well, you can kind of have an advantage in the cross, like you're saying with basketball players coming in, and that if you already have the cross that incorporates everything there. So, I mean, it really sounds like a great sport that's growing, and a lot of people getting into it. It's great to see. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, it, it's also great to see how the game can influence and be a positive uh, force for uh, the league currently is, is trying to work with more uh, Native American communities and reservations around the state to spread lacrosse in hopes of pushing athletics as a positive influence in kids' lives. And, and I think lacrosse is one of the unique things, uh, sports, because of its spiritual and cultural background. So real quick, 15 seconds. Uh, teams, any upcoming games or anything you want to you talk about? Absolutely. So we're, we're ranked fifth in the state right now. Uh, we're playing uh, number three ranked Lake Ridge at Hillsborough Stadium. Uh, Tuesday at 7 p.m. Um, so come out if anyone wants to see this game. And this was Nick DeFay from uh, Glenco. Thank you very much, Coach. We really appreciate it. Now we're going to go back to uh, Brad and Michelle. All right, well, I'll oh. definitely be at that game. <laughs> Did you know that Jim Brown was an All-American lacrosse player at the University of Syracuse, one of the best running backs to ever play this game? Did no. you know that? No, but I know now. You know that? Okay, lacrosse game next yes. week. Lincoln at OES, April 3rd. Have a great time. PortlandSportsBeat.com. <laughs> that is Michelle. I'm Brad, PJ, <laughs> yeah. and the man from Louisville. Bye. <laughs>